It's time for Home Sitting Room, everybody. Got our uh, a good special guest tonight that's going to come explain some of the things that we talk out of our asses on, um, I think, because um, I'm pretty sure he knows a couple of things better than me. Um, we've had a crazy fun week in state government, at least. Um, I guess it depends on your definition of fun. Thank you, AC, for making me define everything all the time. Uh, we're Almost Agreement, Almost Agreement at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube. You can go to our website, almostagreement.com. The uh, Voter Guide 23 will be coming soon. Uh, we've got a few more announcements. I've been keeping an eye on the uh, uh, petition polls and everybody pulling in their uh, um, treasurers and uh, all that jazz so that we can do, uh, you know, we can figure out who these people are and we can go from there. So... Um, as much as I got Justin Cordette, he, uh, he's, he runs for all Tennessee. It's a really interesting group. Um, we'll, we'll let him do his whole sales pitch for you guys here in a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, best podcast provider, go, uh, go there. We should be on whatever podcast provider you like and use most often and, uh, give us a friend, follow, share, follow, like all that jazz. So, um, it's a uh, Friday night. Uh, this will be released on Saturday the 8th. Happy birthday to my wonderful, wonderful wife. Um, and, uh, we're gonna do a show. Here we go. Sam Malama, buddy. How you doing? Hey, hey. I'm okay. How are you? All right. Just so everybody knows, like, we're, we are doing a Zoom meeting, so Sam's on camera, and he gets really uncomfortable on camera, even though it's not going to be out to the public. So if he's a little weird tonight, that's that's why. Um, but <laughs> uh, we have Justin Cornette. Like I said, he's from For All Tennessee. Uh, he's uh, coming to us from all the way on the other middle section of the state in Nashville or thereabouts. Um, what's up, man? I haven't talked to you in, in the flesh in a while. Yeah, it's been a little minute, Seth. How you been? Oh, man, busy doing stuff, uh, quitting day jobs, trying to get the other job going, and a million other things. Um, producing a show for the uh, Compass Guys. I do their podcast. Um, oh, that's cool. For I them. Didn't know that. And, and, yeah, it's exciting. They're, they're uh, turn one this year. Their podcast is a year old that I've been doing with them um, as nice. of Monday, I suppose, to be exact. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's been busy. It's been crazy. Like, um, I don't know, let's, we'll just start here because it's the the big easy topic to start with this madness in sure. the state right now. Um, like it's, I you know I I am no fan of the GOP. I haven't been a fan of the GOP. I'm not a fan of the Democrats either. But like I can't figure out what the thought process is of anybody to think that this exclusionary or uh, expulsion process was the way to go about this thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that. I think that what the intention was, and you know, I'm I'm speculating as an outside observer for sure, uh, but I think what the intention was was to show that the legislature is a place to do legislative business through a legislative process, and not a place to uh, incite protests or you know do these things that are outside of the legislative process inside the legislature, the protest that bring the protest inside the legislature. I think that that was a, the statement that they were trying to send, but I think that they're going to end up doing a very poor job. With I, it. I, exactly. Cause I think like to me, they, they, I think they already did what they, the, what, what politically speaking, not legally or whatever, but just in the politics side of it, I think pulling their committee seats as the punishment, and stopping there would have been the right play, because you you Agreed. you take what little teeth these these this, these people have in the first place, because they're Democrats in the state of Tennessee, so they don't have a lot of teeth anyway. The only place they probably have any real decent influence are in some of these subcommittees that they're that they have leadership in. Um, so you already took that away, and so now you just have three blank members of the House that they're not going to vote with you anyway. But now that you just took away anything they had a chance to do anything with, <clears throat> but instead you well, go that. You go to that next step, and now it's national news. Kamala is in Nashville right now. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is it, it's not – it's the optics that are – it's the optics versus what it accomplishes Yeah, um, that is the problem. Well, because it accomplishes you know, if, nothing. If, essentially, uh, at least the Pearson person I'm not so sure about, but as, as I've heard, at least, all the rumor is that Nashville is going to appoint the, yeah. jo- the Justin Jones right back into the seat – Pearson will get the same thing and they're going to come back stronger with a bigger kind of backing behind them, more notoriety, more clout, all that fun right, stuff. Cause they're both freshmen this year. If I recall That's if I right. correctly. Uh, and, and, um, both of them are, um, not, they're not able to be expelled for the same reason. 
So if they are in violation of decorum in the same way, they can't, they can't be expelled for the same thing. So they could literally just come back in and do the same stuff next oh, week. Double jeopardy applies. For it. Nice. I didn't know that. that. That's a fun little nugget that I hadn't heard yet. Uh, that's quite interesting. Because again, like to me, like the only one that the only one that would have had at least some short term numbers game value would have been Gloria, because Knox County is the only one that wouldn't have sent them back. Because I don't right. think Knox County Commission would have sent Gloria back, because Knox County Commission's nine two Republican. Right. Um, well, Gloria is uh, she. There's a, uh, she's got a lot of enemies. Sure, <laughs> that's an easy. That's a that's a, a kind. A, I don't know if that's a kind way to put it, but that's probably as kind as you can get. Um, because I think no, I, 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 I think she she wins the seat walking just walking away again on on a special election, especially because I'm assuming that that special election would go in with this city race that we have here this fall. And probably, city of Knoxville is primarily Democrats anyway, so right. you're going to have a high Democrat turnout election with a special state house seat election. Who's going to? I mean, I think I don't think any Republican has a snowball's chance in hell of getting in. And winning much there, as we saw in our twenty-one regular city elections, anyway. Right. Yeah. Um, no. I mean, if uh, you know, she's supposed to be the one that's super beatable. She's supposed to be the one that is this radical extremist and all this stuff that makes her really vulnerable. And uh, GOP hadn't been able to put her out since Eddie Smith did. Well, they haven't put uh, anybody worthwhile like this. Pose a cut, pause a I can never figure out how to say his name that they put up against him this last cycle. Like, like the, my, my favorite, the best example of how worthless of a candidate this guy was is that even he didn't use his name. He just goes by pause. <laughs> and so like the compass guys are working their show. And this was back during that cycle. And we were working the show and they were talking about all the different races going on. And Jesse's sitting here stumbling, trying to guess how to say his name. He's like, I've never heard his, I've never heard his name said out loud. I don't know right. how to pronounce his name. He hasn't talked to us and explained to us at least how to say his name. And it's like that you have that little name recognition. Um, in a, and they didn't, as I've heard, at least they, they redistricted more to get rid of Eddie Manis than they did to help or to hurt Gloria. And they just, stat, they just poked at Gloria in the process. Yeah. It's how I'd heard uh, well, that, that they, went down. She ended up having to move to get into that district, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Like a block, but yeah. 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 They drew her out by like a, a block. Right. Isn't that crazy? Um, uh, and, and, you know, and, and that's the thing. This stuff happens all the time. They literally drew her out of her own district by a block intentionally because they were trying to get her out. Because they, got, I mean, they knew they didn't have a candidate that they could get, they could beat her, even in the but, redistrict. The whole thing yesterday was you heard from three different people about how they had continued, continuously been shut down and not been able to use their voice on behalf of their constituents, uh, regardless of how you feel about their policy, any of that stuff. There's an argument there. You know, if, if it was some conservative legislator, Bruce Griffey, last year, uh, he got uh, his – uh, key card wouldn't access the building after he upset leadership last year. Uh, I mean, they, they, they do this stuff all the time and they wonder why we get stuff like we got a week or so ago. Right. Uh, I, I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often. I, I feel like because it doesn't happen more often, it shows a serious lack of spine by a lot of people that we elect. Right. Uh, the ones that know. we like, and, and to that end, I mean, as 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 much as Gloria has attempted to, this is the first time she's really stepped out in the decorum nature to put the shit show True together. Story. It's like, I mean, how many years is she? How many? How many term? Well, this is what her third or fourth term. I think it's her third. You know, and I it's think. like that was that's her campaign. You know, that's who she is. Like I joke, right. uh, I joke with Matt Shears a uh, uh, couple times ago when I had him on the show. I was like, it's got to be fun to be Gloria. Because you don't really have to, does. you don't have to you, you, like success is success is being loud and obnoxious. Success is not getting anything done. You know, nobody's anybody. Nobody is seriously. Uh, how do I word this? Anybody who seriously follows what's going on in Nashville knows that Gloria is not going to accomplish anything legislatively. When she says, "I want to put this bill on the floor," like the, the uh, her best bill was killed and then reintroduced by a Republican from like Clarksville or it's something like that. 
that's happened to her three or four times at least. Right. And I guess if you want to go, if you want to work at it backwards, you can count that as a win for her, which I suppose it is. But at least uh, like in the, in, in, in the score sheet of, of, of actually documented, this is a bill submitted right. by Gloria Johnson wins. She has zero. And again, going right. back to the pause guy, that was his campaign. His campaign was she is ineffectual. Right. And it's, she's ineffectual by design. Right. Like they, they literally, if she does something that they want to allow through, Please. they'll just uh, amend somebody else's bill with that language so that she doesn't get it passed. Right. That happens. Yeah. It and, happens all the time to lots of Democrats. Right. And you know, uh, go ahead. Two years ago, real quick, uh, two years ago, we passed a bill um, that ended no knock raids in Tennessee, uh, required de escalation training, uh, uh, required uh, police to intervene in situations of excessive force, uh, report on uh, situations of excessive force. I mean, the whole nine yards. Tennessee passed one of the most comprehensive and good. Um, uh, police reform bills in the wake of everything catching on fire a couple of summers ago. Well, the reality is, is the original bill was brought by two Democrats uh, during the summer session on COVID. Two Democrats brought the bill with the language uh, on um, uh, ending no-knock raids, and it didn't make it out of committee. Three months later, in regular session, two Republicans ran the exact same language, and the bill didn't get a no vote in either uh, either House or Senate. So, I mean, we play these games all the time, um, and it's about controlling narratives and controlling the perception. I mean, that's just what it is. Yeah. Uh, we have to be smart enough to see it and recognize it yeah. for what it is. I'm curious, and uh, i got to find it in my stack of random stuff that I set aside. Um, so there was some paperwork circulating, and I guess it's officially on the state website now of the record on uh, Resolution 63, 64, 65 on, who, on the yeas yeah. and nays. Um, yeah. I would be curious to see um, – like I can't – my assumption, my, my tinfoil hat assumption is that they it was designed that Gloria was not going to get kicked out. Now whether we want to play the racist card, which has been out there in, in, on the topic uh, since it happened or not – but that list of Republicans who voted nay on her expulsion, the the surface level of me says that they should be. I would assume we're going to hear about some some punishments for those peoples, or maybe some congratulations because it was done on purpose. Yeah, I, I really wonder about that too. Um, although I am not of the mindset that it was a predestined thing. Um, I feel like I watched most of um, those hearings mm -hmm. uh, while I was driving around yesterday, actually. And uh, the tone from Justin Jones, he continuously went after the speaker and just battered him and was defiant, to say the very, very least. Uh, Pearson it was the same but not nearly as bad as what jones was you know they were talking about a lot of things that is inside baseball that the legislature would like to have inside baseball but with gloria gloria was the only one of the three up there saying oh no i wasn't yelling the claims are false you know, I, I wasn't banging on anything. I didn't use the bullhorn. I didn't do any of those things. Right. And her tone in general was, I, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything wrong. Right. Uh, yeah, it you seemed have like no reason to expel me. And she didn't go after the speaker over right. and over and over again like the other two did. And I think that that's really what did them in. Right. I think the legal tactic was different, right? The legal tactic of the way her expulsion letter was written exactly the same as the other two. And she had grounds to be like, no, 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 I didn't do like the bull, the whole bull, bullhorn bit. If I was better prepared, I would have that part set up. Cause that was the, that was the sick burn of her portion of the show when she was like, right. Oh, I'm glad you asked about the bullhorn. Cause I'll tell you exactly where my bullhorn is. Cause I do own one, but it wasn't the one you saw on that video. That was a great little little spat that she put out in that one. Um, yeah. And it's just like, I don't know. I don't watch enough. I, 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 you guys, but Sam watches way more uh, state stuff on 
on the YouTube channel and stuff like that than I do because it's just I I get so like it's it's all, it's almost instantaneously like a painful boredom for me trying to watch it because like I'm saying <laughs> and I, I mean and I guess I was genuinely surprised like I when they started when it started yesterday I was I, I told Sam I told Matt Shears I told a couple other people I was talking to I was like I was like it's not the right political move but they're going to expel all three of them and so I was very well, surprised that they didn't expel Gloria. Well, what's what gets me about it is the general sentiment with Republicans nationally right now is that the brag thing is an unprecedented um, uh, thing that it, where a president is being prosecuted because he's a political opponent and it opens a door to when Biden steps out, he's going to get all these prosecutions. So there may never be another president that we ever have that doesn't get prosecuted at some point. Now, um, and this whole idea of retribution and, and the general sentiment of the Republican party is it's bad and it should not be done. But what we just did is exactly that in the state legislature and everybody's running around saying this was a great move. Right. Uh, it, it's, it, it's not, um, there, I mean, you could have taken, like you said, you could have taken away their access to committees. You could have forced them to go into some sort of ethics or rules, um, um, class or seminar that the legislature put together so that these guys would have a re-education about how to work the legislature or something as, as their discipline. And that would have been, in my opinion, much, much more effective uh, than expelling them so that they can come back five days later and not be expelled for the same thing they just got expelled for. Right. Not to mention all the, 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 re- amazing amount of media that all three of them have gotten oh, in the last yeah, yeah, two weeks. Yeah, I, mean, I, I mean, well, Gloria was on I, MSNBC. She was on what PB, not PBS. What is it? Is it PBS uh-huh. news hour? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. She, she was, she hit like two or three national news <clears throat> shows that they were talking about it. And like I said, I mean, uh, uh, Kamala's in, uh, she's probably gone already, but she was in Nashville doing a whatever and then there's some picture floating around of biden talking doing what we're doing a zoom call with him um mm-hmm. earlier today or yesterday or whatever it's just it's it it, it the, the the question i have it, it, and i know the answer to this i think i know the answer to this but the, I, the the reality to me though and i put this up on on our almost agreement page it's like does anybody actually think this changes anything long term well medium term i think not I, mean, I do I think Knoxville long term has is already shifting blueish, more purple, I guess, than the the old school red that it, that Knox County is at large. I think Knoxville, Knox County is starting to push a little bit less red. Maybe is a better way to put it. But I don't think you know. I don't think next session we're going to have a, a sixty forty house. It'll still be seventies and twenties. It will be. You know, and it will be for the foreseeable future. Yeah, and I and I guess what I guess my take on it is I don't think that this event, maybe other than to add to a bunch of other different instances, is going to be this. I don't see this as a catalyst to the, the to a blue wave or some sort of statewide change. I think there's a plenty of other stuff the GOP has been doing that's gotten enough people bent out of shape. The thing that I see changing is the idea that you can use. <clears throat> new and different tools at your disposal to try to get rid of political enemies. Uh, I feel like there's a, that there, there, that's a trend that's happening across. The, I mean, it's always happened in different ways. Um, there's always been undermining of candidates and uh, uh, competition and all that stuff, but we're, we're using tools of government national level and state level to do this. And that's uh, a, a little bit disheartening and concerning. Yeah. Um, you know, if uh, we already have a Democrat and Republican party that in a lot of States has made sure that third parties don't exist. Um, and now we're getting to a point where the, the two remaining parties are using the force of government or, uh, you know, a, a jury box to uh, uh, go after, um, people that threaten their power 
Right. Uh, and that's a bad thing. Right. Because I mean, I think that's I think that's one of the things about um, I think that's one of the realities of Trump is that it's not that Trump is a Republican and it's the Democrats are going after him. It's he's not really a Republican either. Right. And he's willing. He's I not. Mean, he's willing to do things right or wrong that the establishment was not a big fan of. And so to me, it's yeah. not, it's not so much that it's, that it's the Democrats trying to get rid of the Republican presidential candidate through weird legal means. It's that they're trying to get rid of this outsider candidate period. I think that's, yeah. I mean, I think Trump's got, uh, but I, Trump's just not a Republican to me. I don't, I don't, I, he never was. He, and he just plays in on, on the well, ease of it. I mean, you can't, claim that you're supporting the constitution and the founding fathers and also call for nationalizing police, for example. Right. Um, I mean, that's very contradictory and not good. <laughs> you know, right. Right. I mean, nationalizing police is like the worst idea ever. And it's only come out of one president's mouth ever. Right. That I know of. I don't know. I, actually, that one, that one of the of all the many things, I think that one flew over my head. I don't know if I heard about that. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's lots of them. I mean, the I, I like to take the guns first and worry about due process later. Is right. a direct quote uh, after that shooting, and or I think it was Orlando a few years back when they did this big gun control summit, and that's the line that he opened it up with. You know, I mean, he is. A weather vane who sure. pandered to the conservative constituency, but he's not a constitutional conservative I mean, by any not. stretch of the imagination right. himself. I agree with that one hundred percent. Okay, so um, I don't know, Sam. You got anything else on the the Gloria and uh, statewide? No, I, I'm in agreement that that the two gentlemen didn't really help themselves much with what they decided to say during their speeches. But I mean, how much yeah. do you think it was that they yeah. knew? You know, I mean, I think they knew. I think they were talking to their their local, back in Memphis and national bodies. I think they knew. By the time it got to the hearings, I think they knew that they were coming right back. There was one I mean, rep I saw a uh, an interview with before I came over who was said he was right next door to one of the guys that got expelled, and he claimed that he was asked to vote to expel him because he had already talked to his local commission or whatever, and he's probably going to get brought back in anyway even if he in the event that he got expelled which a lot of people assume that yeah and would. that's another element of that's another element of this uh i think is you have lots of republicans that are claiming that, that justin jones in particularly wanted to be expelled so that he could be a martyr right so what did the republican party do give him it expelled right. i mean yeah. Gave him exactly what he wanted. And now he's coming back, and I, I, I just I, I don't understand it at all. So you say I mean, when you say I, next door, you mean next door office wise? Yeah, yeah, office wise. So if it's next door office wise, you, uh, Justin, you can attest this that it would have to be a Democrat because they no, it was a Republican, uh, Richie from wait, Maryville. Which uh, Richie? Uh, which uh, whose office? Uh, I, I who's think next was, door neighbor? I think it was Jones. Jones next door neighbor. I believe so. They Probably don't split them up. Uh, that, uh, a structural question. They don't. They don't split them up in Nashville like they do in D.C. I mean, to some extent, but they are Democrats and Republicans on each floor. Yeah. Okay. So it's probably uh, going to depend on so, you know, when you come in, when someone leaves. You got to. I don't think they're just going to every single legislative session make everyone do a big I mean, musical chairs. Here's one for next year for you guys for four all that, that we need to put into state law that there that there are 99 offices for the House, and each office is numbered. And whatever district you represent, you get that office. So whether so, my district eighteen has an office. Whether it's a Republican, a Democrat, or Independent, they go into the district eighteen office. Uh, you know, just put yeah, them in order. That won't float. That won't <laughs> float because some of them are different sized offices. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Food chain, you know, they want bigger offices. I mean, so. I know it just it just seemed logical to me, like the whole Gloria mess from a couple of years ago. It's like, why does you know? I guess that was back when it was District Seventeen before it, or what was whatever the district was before they redistricted it and turned it into ninety. Yeah, you know, it seems like well, if that's the, you know, if that's the district, whatever office, just go to the office. It's where you work. Just right. I don't know. It's logical no, I, and straightforward. I <laughs> you know, I, I get that, and I'd agree with it if all the office, offices were created the same, but they aren't. 
All right, one thing we learned tonight, all offices are not created equal. All right, so <laughs> all right, so for for people that haven't heard you on the show before, um, give us the um, the cliff notes of, of what you do and why you are so uh, intimately involved in what we're talking about tonight. Sure. So I started a nonprofit uh, called For All Tennessee, and uh, uh, what we do is we are trying to create a third way to get policy done in Tennessee. Uh, right now, there are two ways, and those two ways are to go and beg Democrats or and or Republicans. Um, we, what we want to do is we want to collect feedback from uh, the people of Tennessee at large, all of them, and use their feedback to kind of bully the legislature around. So... Um, we take on pieces of legislation that we genuinely think 90% of the population of Tennessee would agree on. Um, and, uh, regardless of what side of the aisle that they're on, uh, we stay away from controversial topics that, um, nobody agrees on in any way, shape, form or fashion. Uh, don't touch a lot of healthcare. We will never talk about abortion. Um, you know, uh, Guns is not something that we are heavily involved in and, or I mean, stuff like that, that. You know, you can have the right answer and 70 percent of the people will still disagree with you. Um, we take on things like civil asset forfeiture, which, if you don't know, is where police can take stuff from you without charging you with a crime. It is a thing. It is real. It exists. And it happens to the tune of about 16 to $18 million a year in this state. Um, Tennessee has the highest tax on beer produced uh, in this state, in the entire country. It's the highest tax in the entire country of its time. Uh, and by a long shot, it's the highest tax. Um, it, it, district attorneys and police can look at phone records with a subpoena and don't have to have a warrant. I mean, these are things that you just tell people about and they're like, yeah, it shouldn't be that way. We should, we've got a bill that would require police to record the interrogations of children because that's not already required by law. You know, uh, so we try to identify as many of these things as we can. And then we ask the public at large to check a box and tell us and uh, their legislator uh, whether they support or oppose these policies. Uh, and then we would take that uh, survey to the legislature and say, hey, you know, we had 200,000 people fill out this survey and 5,000 of them are super voters in your district. And um, 197,000 people think that we should, in fact, require the interrogations of children. Would you like to help us with this? No. Um, or require the recording of the interrogations of children, I should say. Uh, so you know, w the idea is to kind of create a bully pulpit on a lot of policy that they may or may not be interested in passing without uh, the people speaking up and saying, hey, we want these bills passed. Right. And so, like, I got involved with you guys through Josh who he's mm -hmm. moved on to go make babies apparently professionally. Uh, that's my understanding Correct. of what he's doing for a living now. He's just Correct. out. He's just like, out uh, propagating the earth and doing doing well at that. Um, he's going forth and being fruitful. Right, and I and I was a. I don't know. I I go back and forth. I I've tried to I try to I try I tried to call myself a libertarian less just because we have a mayor in this county who calls himself a libertarian. And he, I disagree with him on so much stuff. And, right. and, and philosophically that I don't want to muddy the waters of conversation to say that I am like him. Um, but so like I, I got turned on to Josh through the libertarian party when he used to run the East Tennessee chapter and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so um, a lot of these bills are stuff that, that at least that in, in previous conversations I've had with you guys are stuff that usually are philosophically lined up with people that are more libertarian leaning. Um, well, I, I think that the pieces of legislation that we choose um, are uh, pieces that would empower people or limit government. Uh, empower people is how Democrats hear liberty and freedom. And uh, limit government is how constitutional conservatives hear um, uh, liberty and freedom. And 
we think that there's the the most common ground on issues between the far left and the far right is in in those kind of things um and yeah we I, we've gotten a lot of responses on our surveys and from a lot of different people in a lot of walks of life and overwhelmingly uh, everyone has found most of the things that we do uh, to be many things that they're interested in. So, you know, you say we can't, we can't govern through parties. We are a nation that was supposed to be self-governing right now. We are a nation that is not self-governing. We are governed by two different parties, whichever one has the power in a particular jurisdiction governs period. Um, that's not the people doing it. And what we're trying to create is something where the people can have a, a larger say in their government just by checking a box so that we can go and tell their legislature or legislators uh, how they feel. Right. Because to me, like a, a good, like a, um, a good, uh, illustration of what we're talking about here. I think it's like, I've joked about running for office a couple of times here and there. Um, this next cycle, I have all the options in the world. I could be, com- I could run for com- County commission. I could run for state Senate. I could run for, um, for state, uh, house seat 18. They're all up on the ballot this next year, uh, the 24 cycle. Um, and a, a friend of mine asked, like, when are you going to run so we can get some shit done? And that's like, I'm not going to get anything done. If I go, that's right. Because if I'm lucky enough to get there, I'm going to get there with an I after my name, which means I'm less liked than the Democrats to all the Republicans and less liked than, right. uh, than, than uh, the Republicans to a Democrat. So the, the, you know, having a good change and effort and, and, you know, going in with uh, what's the word uh, in good faith to try to get something done just isn't going to happen without a support of a group like yours or something like that, who was helping me push bills through by leaning on other people in the way that you guys lean on people because and I isn't going to do anything in this house ever. Right. Right. Uh, you know, and that's the thing, um, you know, look at somebody, let me go to the libertarian argument since you are the libertarian Ish. folks. Yeah, okay. sure. So look at somebody like Ron Paul. He was in office for what? 30, 40 years, something like that. Is that accurate? I, it's been, it's, it's, it's been a minute, but yeah, he was there for a while. Yeah. Okay. And he was there. He was constantly a dissenting voice. He was often on the right side of issues when everybody else was on the wrong side of issues. What did he accomplish? Right. I mean, name something that he did. Uh, because he didn't because he's one man he he made a decent run for a presidential nomination right um you know so uh, parties aren't the way to go about it in my opinion we've got we have all this technology we have all these brilliant minds we have uh um the ability to come up with a way to amplify the voice of Tennesseans in a way that benefits them and actually has power behind it. Um, and if we cannot find a way to do that, uh, we will never be what this country was envisioned to be a country that was self-governing, uh, governed for and by the people. All right. And so in your, in, in your listing off there, so, um, I've got it pulled up the, a, a little bit of a, 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 a committee on criminal justice subcommittee on this, uh, this House Bill 22 that's talking about doing the uh, recording of, 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 of interviews and interrogations with minors. Um, so we'll, we'll play that here in a second. But I was thinking about it while, we're, while you were talking about it as well, is that um, would that not be something that we would eventually want to expand into all Interviews, yeah, like, isn't that part of the, what like the body cam conversation is too? Yeah, no, I, it, it's exactly what it is. Um, so here's how this went down. Actually, um, I look for ideas in all kinds of different places, and uh, one of my guilty pleasures is I watch uh, Bill Maher and John Oliver on HBO. Um, two people that I don't always agree with that occasionally make a decent point, you know? Um, and I was watching an episode of John Oliver and 
uh, that's where I learned that Tennessee was one of about 20 or 23 states that does not require police to record interrogations at all. Uh, so uh, I picked up the phone and I called Lowell Russell, who is a state rep out of uh, Monroe County, um, and he's former THP. And I asked him if he was aware of this, and he said, well, when he was in THP, they always recorded him, and he thought most cities and counties did. I said, well, that's great. It sounds like we would just be codifying a best practice. And he's like, yeah, I like this idea. Let me make some phone calls. I don't know if TBI records them. That might be a hang-up, so on and so forth. So he calls me up like two days later and says, TBI says they record them too. And I said, well, sounds to me like we'd just be codifying a law. He said, yeah, I've sent everything to my legislative assistant. Uh, we're going to see if we can get a bill drafted up. Well, um, about a week before uh, the filing deadline closed, I went back and talked to Lowell about this. And he said that he had come in to a question about funding for storage um, for these uh, recordings. Uh, and for that reason, he wasn't going to run that bill uh, this year. We were going to look at it and try to run it next year. Um, so I went scrambling and found uh, this bill, HB 22, that only applied to juveniles and picked that up. Uh, so that's how we ended up with this particular bill. But we have uh, worked very hard on this bill, and I think we will get it passed, but it should have already been passed. It should have been passed a month ago, at least. Um, but again, it, it, it's a anybody can go and read the bill. It's HB 22. It's a couple of paragraphs is all it is. And it says, if a child is being interrogated at a police facility, it doesn't count something that's like on the side of the street or anything like that. If they're being interrogated in a police facility, uh, the interrogation must be recorded and it leaves out for exigent circumstances and an officer that thought the recording stuff was turned on in good faith and all that good stuff. So all it does is require police by law to do something that they're in large part already doing in recording um, the uh, uh, interrogations of kids. Gotcha. And so, but so this is a step into trying to get all interrogations recorded. Man yeah. Mandatory. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of a, a, a bellwether. I mean, we know what, I know what the argument will be against it next year when we go to try to tackle it for everybody next year. Money. Mm -mm. what nope um I, I, do you want to let the video do it or do you want me to yeah let's let, it? let's roll the video for a little bit if you got <laughs> if you want to interrupt just give me a, a raise your hand or well, something like I'm, that and i'll pause it the the only dissent in the whole thing comes from uh mr lambert and mr lambert is a very 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 smart guy he's arguably the smartest man on that hill um and his objection is valid and accurate and all those things I just don't think it's a reason to not pass the bill. That's what it boils down to. Got it. All right. So criminal justice subcommittee, we're an hour and 24, 25 minutes into uh, this hour and 30 minute, whatever. Hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, com and committee. All right. You are recognized on House Bill 22. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Uh, I've brought to you House Bill 22. Uh, this bill requires the law enforcement, uh, law enforcement officer conducting a formal interview or interrogation of a, a minor taken into custody for suspicion or commission of a delinquent act to make a video or audio recording of the interview or interrogation. Uh, it also provides an exception for a situation in which the officer in good faith believed in the interview or interrogation was being recorded and there was a technical issue. So it, it, it gives an exception for if there's a technical issue where they could not make that recording. Um, also uh, say that uh, this, be, this bill has passed the Senate 30 to nothing. And uh, I stand by for questioning. Thank you for that explanation. Leader Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know we're short on time. Uh, just a quick question to legal if we can go out of session for a second. All right, we're going to go without objection, go out of session. Here this legal is the service. best that you're looking for. Okay. Mr. Chairman. 
Oh, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't want to speak without being recognized. So. Well, I thought you'd already asked your question in my head. I was waiting on no, the no, legal no, services no, to give you a response. I'm sorry. We're, we're just on the same wavelength today. It's all good. Uh, just a quick question. I know I was talking to the sponsor of this legislation about this, but if an interview is done and evidence is obtained um, that is in violation of this statute, would that trigger the exclusionary rule and that evidence be excluded from being considered? Okay, so the, let me see if I'm understanding his question right. Yes, sir. If I, I guess if my kid was arrested on suspicion of vandalism or whatever, and they're talking to the kid, or they take my kid in and they're talking to him, or whatever, and they don't record it, but even the, but in that period where they were supposed to be recording it, he admits to said crime. Correct. Since the since this House Bill twenty two wasn't fo- wasn't followed. Will it therefore be excluded as evidence? Correct. Moving forward. Okay. Correct. I just want to. That, okay. I just want to make sure. That I is the objection. Okay. Michelle Fogarty, Legal Services. The bill doesn't speak to that, but if you put it into law and require law enforcement to record them, and then they don't, and none of the exception doesn't apply, then yes, it, the exclusionary rule would be would apply because it would be done in violation of state law. Thank you. Okay. That's all I have. Can you pause it there? Any other yeah. questions for legal services? Okay. So. What, what that is, is, you know, they went out, they asked the legal services lawyer that, you know, helps everybody understand exactly how the code is going to be affected when these changes are made. And she confirmed his question. Okay. So the issue is right now, a lot of, of police departments are doing this, but if they require it by law, it will change it to where it would trigger that exclusionary rule and throw out any confession. However, if they just hit record, that w- they won't run into that problem. If they hit record and it doesn't record, they don't run into that problem because the bill it excludes that. So the question here is, do we like the law the way it is where they don't have to be recorded, which opens the door for manipulation in a number of different ways and favors the police? Or do we want to require them to be recorded and protect the kids? That's the question. Right. Right. Uh, and that's that's the one sticking point. That's the one objection that we've had to this bill. Right. But again, we've discussed that this is a starter to a, a bigger picture. And you said that Lambert's one of the smartest guys that, in, in the room, at least. He probably sees where this is going long term, too. And so object today or tomorrow on this one. That's really may not be what he's actually objecting to. He's objecting to the future version of it when this goes to all. That is a and, fair point. And what right, and what, what what political cost is it him if all interrogations have to be recorded and he doesn't do what he can to stop that? Yeah, I mean, th- that is a fair point. But uh, it's the same question. Right. Do we like the situation the way it is now where they don't have to legally be recorded and we have the opportunity – for manipulation of things and and because of the way the laws are written now or do we want to make it mandatory like we you know just like miranda rights or something along those lines where you have to do this or the uh, confession is excluded well because i mean Um, it almost sounds to me like at this point that's the only time they're not obligated to record it you got body cam and all the outside stuff right and i'm i'm pretty sure most counties in tennessee is i don't think it's state law yet is it that for body cams yeah I, I think it is state it is law. Because yeah. I, I I know we went through a whole big process locally in the last couple of years of trying to get the funding lined up to get all ours in. But it, it, it's it, my imp- my impression was that it was a local push, not a state one. But it might have been a state one. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. I think the state requires body cams, though. But it seems like, I, so, moral of the story is it seems like we're at the point where like 90% of your interaction with the police are already recorded anyway. So let's just fill in that one little gap. Especially where it's significantly cheaper than a body cam to just have a little recording device on a table. Sure. Yeah. And a hard drive to store the stuff on. I mean, whoop de doo. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean Knox it, County it, Sheriff's it, Office can put out some really, really bad recruitment videos. They've got room on their servers for for some uh, confessions, I'm sure. Right. But, but yeah, that's that's the sticking point on it is um, we, we put we put this on the very last calendar. Um, or we didn't, the um, leadership rolled it to the very last calendar to try to stall it. 
um, and uh, he'd probably be hurt either next week or the following week um, in full committee. Uh, so we'll just have to see. Yeah, we're running out of time. We don't got much left of this uh, yeah. this, this session or this. Yeah, this half session's session. been this session's been a little odd. It's uh, it's felt very. It, it, it's felt very scheduled, very like there was an itinerary and we, we have done the itinerary and you couldn't add to the itinerary. And as soon as the itinerary is over, we're shutting it all down. So yeah. um, it, it seems like it's gone really fast. And uh, I mean, that's how it is to be every year because I can't keep up. I can't even pretend yeah, to keep up. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It just seems a little more closed off this year uh, for whatever reason. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, was, I don't, there, so much oxygen was eaten up by the two big ones from the from the get go. At least all the attention spans seem to be swallowed whole by the the, yeah. the juvenile trans and the uh, public drag bill. Just took yeah. so much air out of anything else going on. Yeah, uh, and that might be part of the plan is to shut it all down and get out of the news cycle for a little while. I'm sure. That, I'm sure Sexton and and, and them are and, and uh, McNally for that matter are really looking forward to not being in session. <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, man, this next <laughs> week, everybody's going to have a field day with what just happened at the legislature. You know, I mean, every Democrat leaning show, uh, John Oliver, um, John Stewart, all these guys are going to be covering this and talking about what a sh- shit show this was. Uh, and, you know, again, <laughs> It's 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 just disappointing that all this attention has been called to us in this way to only have the two people that got kicked out come right back. Right. right. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Such I, a waste of time. I wait for the other shoe to drop on the McNally story. I feel like that we've only got half the story so far. Yeah. I feel like there's there's gonna be a lot more S N L did uh McNally. Yeah. 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 It's like cold open, SNL I think it was. Implies, I think. But I mean but I, yeah. I don't know. It, like I, like, Matt Shears is the one that told me about it, and I believe my my initial reply to him is that's too on the nose. That's got to be bullshit. Like, yeah, like well, it's it's uh, it's too you know. like that. We did this. We did this show like back in the eighties and nineties when like the big moral panic over gays was happening back then. You know, every the, the loudest, most angry anti-gay federal legislatures all had you know uh, gay prostitutes in their closet somewhere. And it just seemed like yeah. was, this McNally one was too too perfectly on the nose. Like it was too scripted, and I was like, I don't buy it. It, it, it you know, there those guys. A lot of those guys are really eccentric, and uh, they've got power, right? Um, and a number of different uh, aspects of life, so <laughs> they can control stories or perception or lots of different things, and so. None of it surprises me anymore, man. None right. of it. All right, so we got the twenty two we talked about. What other ones did you put on the were on your calendar this year that you've been working on that have <laughs> have not gotten passed and where, what happened with them? Well, uh I tell you I I I'll tell you two that I, I'm a really big fan of. Uh, one uh is we're going after uh the beer tax in Tennessee. Um and I mentioned this earlier, but what it, what it is specifically is a tax uh, on production uh, when it goes to resale. So if you are a brewer in the state of Tennessee and you fill up a keg and you want to sell that keg to a bar so that they can put it on tap in their bar, you pay $1.29 a gallon in tax on the beer that you produced. $1.29 a gallon on the beer that you produced. Um, so if you are Anheuser-Busch and you're sending it in from across state lines, you dodge this tax entirely. So what it does, what the tax does, is it hurts small businesses in Tennessee that would like to get into the beer industry. And it's an anti-competitive tax where they pay $36 on a keg that, uh, in tax that Anheuser-Busch doesn't pay. Um, so 
Tennessee at a dollar twenty nine is I think thirty cents higher than the next highest state, and that dollar twenty nine is six times, seven times the national average. Um, so um, we're, we're going to try to get uh, all the brewers together to hold hands and uh, help them get our survey question out there and get their mailing list checking our boxes and uh, see if we can't go in there and uh, push, those, push those guys around. So, well, and I'll get, tell you what, on that, that, get that to me because I at, if, through – other stuff that I have going on, I have contact with every Knoxville, Knox County brewer on the regular. I can help push that have, around for sure. I would appreciate that help very, very much. Absolutely. Because um, I because I want to say I had Marty Vallis from Fanatic on a couple, like a year and a half ago. Um, yeah, I know Marty. And he's a good dude. He's kind of crazy, but, you know, mm-hmm. he, he, he plays in kegs for a living. Um, yeah. And he's, I want to say when I had him on the show, he he'd, he'd kind of mentioned that in passing, and we didn't really get into any depth on it. Because he's been around, yeah. around like he's he's from California, started brewing out there, spent much time in Germany, all that kind of stuff. And so he's yeah. on he all that kind Calhoun's of part. He's breweries. pretty well knowledge. Say again. Yeah, he started Calhoun's breweries. Yep. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. Um, I, I used to work with Calhoun's when I was a kid, so I'm, I've known him for a long time, actually. Yeah, they, they're they're good. They've, they've got a he's got a, a, a tap room in the mall now, which is pretty fun. Oh yeah, yeah. Right good in the middle him. of the food court is a is a fanatic tap room. Huh. Um, good for him. Yeah, so I, I um, guess they're going to make up for that tax loss on uh, the 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 hemp law one that's coming through. Well, that's the interesting thing about this. Um, none of those tax dollars actually goes to state coffers. None of it. Every bit of it goes to the cities and counties it's produced in. So it would actually take money out of the city and county budget. And I, I went looking through the Knoxville budget. On, just the, beer, to, on the beer one or – yeah, on the beer okay. tax, yeah. Uh, every dime of the beer tax goes to the city or county that it's produced in. Um, but I went looking through the budget in Knox County, and I'm not sure I had the right line, but if I had the right line, it looked like it'd be, if we, like, eliminated the tax entirely, it would take, like, two or three, th- two or three million dollars out of, uh, what, seven hundred fifty, eight hundred million dollar budget. So, I mean... Eh, I don't it's know. In the bucket. City of Knoxville is only like three hundred million. It's, I'm not, not that it's not much. I thought it was more than that. Yeah, but Knox, regardless, Knox, Knox County is just under a billion, but six hundred and something of that is uh, Knox County schools. Maybe that's what I was thinking of. But regardless, the line that I found for beer tax on the budget uh, was a couple three million dollars. So again, it's still. One percent of right. the budget. I mean, and how much? I mean, how much is they are they getting in sales tax for these breweries and stuff that are putting in, and, right? And other, you know, the other taxes they make their real like property tax. I mean, all the breweries around here are, used to be the shit part of town. How much is that? How much more are they paying in property tax and stuff mm-hmm. like that now? And that's where the real money's coming from. Right. No, a hundred percent. So you know, I, I don't, I don't see it as a big th- as a big hindrance. Uh, in most of these cases, because again, it's a small portion of some place like Knoxville's budget. And to my knowledge, there's not a brewery in Scott County, you know? Right. Uh, so it's not like they're going to be losing out on anything. So you, you, most of the money that would be, that would be lost because this tax would happen in Knoxville, Nashville, Memphis, Chattanooga, maybe the tri cities. Um, there wouldn't, you wouldn't see a whole lot, elsewhere uh because of it so not to mention we've got a super majority republican legislature that would like to see those democrat run areas that i just mentioned um rein in their budgets some so i don't know it, it, it's more of a struggle than i thought it would be to get it to pass uh i thought we would right because you thought republicans say, would do anything they could to cut a tax if they you know cut, I, to I, cut I, a tax I, right I, mean, I, I thought i could go and say hey republican this is the highest in the nation. We should cut it dramatically. And they would be like, yeah, I agree. <laughs> How do we not just, already do this already? This, uh, this doesn't make yeah, any no, sense. It, this is a pillar of the platform of our party. We must do these things. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, um, it, again, it's one of those things, though, if we can get all these brewers uh, to email out our survey question uh, to their email lists, I mean, you're talking about hitting – hundreds of thousands of people 
uh, and that would be a lot of leverage going and talking to these legislators. And that's the, that's the idea behind it, you know? Yeah. And there is, I don't know, it's got uh, the, uh, the politics of it have kind of fallen apart locally, but there, there was a Knoxville Brewers Association. I think they still technically exist. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know a guy who is, who is, or was a part of it. I haven't talked to him in a while, so I don't know if they've, they may have dissolved because that might be my shortcut and I'll just get you in touch with him. Sure. Um, well, we're, we are uh, taking that bill off notice right now and it's a caption bill. Um, but we, we've taken that bill off notice and we'll try to bring it back next session. Um, so in between, uh, we're going to try to rally the troops and, uh, we'll definitely get with you and, Excellent. Uh, I'll be I'll be glad to contribute what I can to that cause. Sure. sure. Um, yeah, no. I, uh, let me hit the head real quick. I apologize. Yeah, no problem. Actually, I'm going to step away for just a second myself. All right. I'm a little bit lighter. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, I'm good. That's the same. Just a you know, couple, of, couple of ounces less water weight than me. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the beer tax thing, we went over that. What else did you work on this year? Uh, civil asset forfeiture is a big one. I think we're going to end up getting a bill passed, um, on getting rid of the bond for civil asset forfeiture. Um, if you don't know, um, the way this works in Tennessee currently is if, uh, some of your property is seized and you would like to fight to get that property back, the very first thing you have to do is pay a $350 bond that you do not get back. So if they take a car and it's worth $1,500, you got to come up with $350 to go and argue with them, and you may or may not get it back. So <clears throat> I think we, we, we passed that bill last year, actually. But we didn't get it funded. It didn't make it into the governor's budget, so it didn't become law. Um, but I, I think we'll pass it again this year, and I think we've got a sporting chance at getting it funded this year. Um, we also have a comprehensive civil asset forfeiture bill, again, that I've taken off notice, and we're going to try to uh, have some conversations about and uh, bring back next year. And that bill would move all of this process into a courtroom because right now when you go to get your stuff back and you go in front of the judge and uh, such you are in an administrative court at thp headquarters one of five locations across the state with a judge that is an administrative law judge that's on the thp payroll being prosecuted by a lawyer that is on the thp payroll in a THP office without counsel being provided to you. So um, it's a, definitely a stacked deck in this particular situation. And what we are trying to do is put it in a courtroom to where the, so that there would have to be a conviction tied to any of these seizures. And if there was no conviction, then there would be no seizure. Um, that's the way it should be. That's the way the founders intended it to be. That's the way it was for 200 years. And, uh, um, we're trying to get it back to that. Got it. Cause I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm on board with any of the civil after F, asset forfeiture corrections. I think that's one of the gross things that don't can't quite figure out how it got to exist in the first place. Do you want to know? Please. I would love the history. Um, civil asset forfeiture has always been a thing in the United States. Um, but it was typically re- reserved for things like pirates where they stole property. Uh, you went after them, they abandoned, there was nobody there to arrest. So they took the property, tried to get it back to its rightful owners and auctioned off what they could. not Um, so it's always been a thing, but it wasn't used against the U.S. citizens at large uh, until about 1980 when the war on drugs started. Uh, the original war on drugs bill uh, gave the original federal authorization for civil asset forfeiture to be used in an effort to combat um, the cartels and all these things. Because what you had was 
semi truck rolling down the at the interstate with lots of money in it, um, and it's locked, and the driver has no idea what's in the trailer, and he has no idea whose property it is. All he knows is where he's going, and he's going to some place that's out of the country. So there's nobody there to charge with a crime, but the money is obviously illicit, um, and that's the reason that civil asset forfeiture became a tool in the war on drugs. Uh, and then states began to adopt it after that, and uh, that's how we got here. Joe Biden was apparently a uh, big uh, um, proponent of adding the civil asset for, for forfeiture component to that bill. I did think so. that was fascinating in his campaign where, like, the whole, like, you know, he was the architect of a lot of this shit um, yeah. that the left is now adamantly opposed to, just kind of got left out of any conversation. Yeah, well, that yeah. same bill... Um, uh, 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 that authorized civil asset forfeiture was also the first authorization at the federal level for uh, no-knock warrants. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot that went down right there at the exact same time in one bill that uh, started a lot of the police state type things that we kind of rail against right now. Oh, okay. So uh, I, this is a, a little bit of a non sequitur, but... Uh... You've been following the the I can't remember what the official bill's called. It's the federal bill that that's at least being sold as the TikTok ban, but it isn't. Uh, God, what is it called? That's going to drive me nuts. I, I know what you're talking about. <clears throat> I can't think of what it's called either. It, it bans uh, use of TikTok on government lines, right? Government. No, this network. one's more. It's more on the lines of it gives it. It doesn't say TikTok anywhere in the bill. Like there's a different one that somebody's got in there that's. You know, more of a just a straight up ban on TikTok, where this one's more. It kind of gives uh, the State Department and the um, FBI and NSA and all those access. It's really just a backdoor access for federal law enforcement to get in and play around in social media land. I, I can't say I know a whole lot about right. it, but based off what you told me, it's really actually comical like because been, i thought the whole thing about tiktok was we were afraid china was going to spy on us right and now you're telling me that we're trying to cre create an open door so that we can get all the information from tiktok it's been a, it's it's been <laughs> equivocated to uh what was it called it was the it's the patriot act of the internet is is probably the the best short oh. uh definition of this 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 bill yeah, well i mean that combination of words uh, <laughs> it fills uh, a lot of fear and pause in me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. And so um, has, has any con law been part of any of your guys' work as, uh, lately? Certificate of need? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've uh, been tracking a couple of those bills. All right. Because um, Sam has a bone to pick. Whomever it is that's out there running ads on YouTube or whatever it I is, I figured out who it was. Has been targeting the shit out of him with those ads, and I'm really sad that I'm not getting any of them. But he's getting really annoyed <laughs> with how much, uh, how many, how much of his ad space is getting filled up with uh, anti con law ads. It's not ad yeah, space. It's, it's just YouTube commercials. Yeah, it's your ad yeah. space. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, no, we've actually worked with AFP on uh, uh, some of those certificate of need bills. Um, the one that we were tracking um, primarily is dead currently, um, but Bud Halsey had it in the house, and it would have removed certificate of need for everything except burn units and um, transplant units. Um, so you still would have had to have a certificate of need to open one of those two types of operations. Um, but everything else would be exempt from their certificate of need stuff. So um, I, I can live with a certificate of need for, you know, a half dozen burn units across the state and a uh, half dozen transplant units. All right. So uh, help, help, help me be the devil's advocate here. Um, sure. Because it's one of those, like, on the surface, there is a there is a marginal logic to it. Like the idea that we don't want 57 hospitals in Knox County that could service a million people. And there's only a half a million people here total. Um, and that there's costs involved with that and expenses and all this different stuff. Like I can, I can, I could twist myself to get to the idea of why a certificate of need law exists in the first place. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you're the better history guy than me. Like, I don't understand. Like, again, this is one of those things I don't understand the beginnings of. And I, I rail against it on a principle that I'm not sure. Like, I, I'm confident in the principle, but I'm not sure I understand the 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 reason for it existing in the first place to rail against, I guess, does that make sense? Well, the, the reason that it exists um, is the concept behind certificate of need is less about the 37 hospitals in Knox County alone. It's more about a hospital opening up uh, 20 miles or 30 miles outside of Knoxville that um, draws enough business to close down the only operation in Scott County. You see what I'm saying? Right. Um, like for us, it would be, um, and, well, Anderson's got Oak Ridge. It's good enough. So uh, Loudoun County next door. Sure. You Something know. like that. So it, it's more to protect those rural areas and the service in those rural areas um, and, and try to keep those people in business in theory. Um, okay. So we're just real quick on, on – um, to, to understand the current practice of the theory would be, so um, what is your understanding of the process currently as far as who's on the board, who is actually part of the process of approving a certificate of need request? Um, I, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's bureaucrats is who it is. But is, um, it, is, is it a state body or is it a local body? It's a state body. Okay. Because, um, again, because, I mean, you're so, talking about the county next door, and, well, if Knox County wants to approve it, then... And they have the control over it. But if it's a state body saying, okay, we hear you, Covenant Health, that you want to build another hospital in Knox County, but that's going to destroy the Blunt Memorial down in uh, Blunt County. So we're going right. to we're gonna say, no, you can't put that on the south side of Knox County. That's exactly what it is. Um, so, uh, and, and the idea behind it, like you say, is to try to take a 10,000-foot view uh, uh, of the distribution of healthcare across the state so that these outfits that are in less populated areas have enough business to keep them in business. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, uh, that's the idea behind it. Um, the question is, is, is it working? Which I, don't, uh, I mean, you know, that, where right. does Tennessee rank in healthcare? And it's not good. Well, and you take um, that, and everybody complains about the lack of rural hospitals, and it's like, well, if the point of this thing was to protect rural hospitals, it's not doing a very good job. Of that, yeah, yeah man, right. anyway. I've seen more stories of rural hospitals closing for whatever reason. I don't know if they've said usually it's due to budget or whatever they can't afford to stay open. Right. That's what I'm saying. Though, it's like if the point if the point is to try to protect the rural hospitals, it's not doing a very good job of that as it stands currently. Correct. Uh, and and you know that's the thing. There's no such thing as a perfect way to do these things, you know. Um, so the question is, do what, what do we think is better, knowing that everything is going to have its flaws? Do we like the idea of a state body controlling this distribution um, and setting up a power structure that, in theory, could be manipulated by moneyed interest in that industry? Or do we go a little more wild west on it that where it can't be controlled and and manipulated in that same way um and let the market um shake these things out uh and i i'm i'm not a big fan of control if both things are going to have flaws i'm typically going to go with the market you know how does that help does that help you understand what the the concept a little bit. I mean, that's always my I, complaint on it because I mean, me and you are pretty close to the same on this, Justin. Like, this is sure. like I'm, I'm, I, I like, which is I maybe where I started leaning libertarian or whatever you want to call it. From there, it's like it's like at the end of the day, there are problems, and with whatever version of whatever thing there is, and for me at least, I just see a, a mounting evidence that letting somebody else try to take care of the problems doesn't seem to be um, making less problems. Right, and so well, I lean on I, I I try to lean on me or my neighbors instead of over theirs, the Nationals, the the DCs of, for that matter. I'm sorry, Sam. Huh? You I was going to say what, what what little I can find on it. Uh, 
what I've seen of, of other states that had certificate of needs as far as they, they adjusted who was on the boards because they did find corruption in some of the boards. Like some states mm-hmm. had boards where it was pretty much just CEOs of the health providers in that state. And mm-hmm. obviously, you know, they're going to lean one way. Right. But other states set it up where they had, you know, their Tennessee, you know, Surgeon General and people in the industry that, that knew more about it actually had like a varied board that could get them, get them more varied approach on it and hopefully come right. to a, a better decision on if there was or was not a, a need for mm-hmm. a, a new hospital, new burn unit, et cetera. Right. Um, I mean, so to me, I'm a person that looks at government is a bunch of people coming together to try to come up with a uniform way to make systems work and to people's advantage. But who those people are is a completely different question. But I mean, everything the government gets put in charge of, every task that the government gets put in charge of, opens a door to nefarious conduct. So, I mean... Is there anybody in the world that thinks that the energy department at the federal level is not run by oil contractors and the like? I mean, is there any, everybody think everybody knows that the people pulling the strings at the Department of Energy are gigantic energy corporations, right? We all know that. So, I mean, I'd say the DOE deals a lot more outside of I mean oil. Do- yeah, I, they did drop the uh, commerce department. Maybe they do oil, oil in the commerce department, obviously. But the DOE dropped the uh, the lab leak as a as as their what was it? Not particularly confident reason for COVID. Oh. DOE was the first uh, federal agency to come out officially to say that they think that's probably where it happened. There was a few, right? Yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, look, I'm just saying, you know, the laws are written, the regulations in those uh, that are written by those departments and by those bureaucracies are typically written to favor large players in those industries. Um, so if you put the government in charge of anything, you are saying here is the structure for, for managing this particular segment of our economy or nation or whatever it is, the people that can benefit from having control over that uh, um, um, entity is, are going to try to get control over it. And they're often successful. Um, this is right. Cause we joke about, government's- right. You joke about like um, maybe more department of defense is what's popping to mind here, but you've got these guys that are, you know, top brass at Lockheed and, uh, Halliburton and stuff like that, that then get appointed to a seat in Department sure. of Defense or S- Secretary of State's office or something like that. And then as soon as that president leaves or that office changes around, they go right back into being, you know, top brass at, at one of the companies that they were in government well, to help manage. Let, let mm-hmm. me, let me, let me give a different example. Um, and just so Dick Cheney, is that what I'm you... thinking of off the top of my head? Dick, Dick Cheney, yeah, he's Halliburton. Like, yeah. yeah, Dick Cheney is Halliburton, vice president, back to Halliburton. That yeah, kind of thing, yeah. yeah uh, uh, but a, a kind of uh, just a anecdote to kind of help you wrap your head around where I'm at here. Um, you guys have seen Aaron Brockovich, right? You guys know the plot behind the movie and all that good stuff. Great flick. Julia Roberts is great. Yeah, right? she just okay. she was just back in the news with the uh, Ohio thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know the EPA's job is to protect people from corporations that would pollute and contaminate their water and all these different things, right? That's their job. Um, The reality is the regulations have been written in a way that protect the companies by limiting the liability that they will have in a given situation. You can only sue for so much money as an individual when you are wronged by one of these companies. If you really want to have a profound effect on companies that put pollution into our communities, um, 
what you would do is you would write laws, liability laws, in a way that favor individuals so that an offender could be sued out of existence right. and be bought by somebody else that's going to do the job more responsibly. Right, like I'm a fan. I think Norfolk, is it Norfolk Southern or whoever it was with that Ohio Railway, Railway thing, I think they ought to be sued out of existence for what happened in, in East Palestine. Palestine? Palestine, right? Palestine, right? Yeah, I think they but should be dead. sued out of existence, but right. instead, but, but in, they're back yeah. running trains two days later, um, yeah. because they're more important than the people. More, like no. rail, rail, rail companies are a bad example too, because they're more important than everything on the fucking planet, apparently. Because, like, they're uh, too big to fail. Well, the the hierarchy of things that we were talking about this with the Compass guys it's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Like, it makes sense, but it doesn't. Is when you get into all this, like. Um, uh, acquisition of, of land and uh imminent domain and stuff like that railroads are above the state of tennessee above the city of knoxville above knox county if city of knoxville state of tennessee and knox county all want to do something but there's a rail line somewhere in that process railroad railroad huh. wins that argument if they don't want to do it they're not doing it they don't have to interesting I yeah. did not realize you and i our, our front yards can get hacked down by five feet because they want to uh, you know widen the street in front of your house without much real right. pushback but if uh, if that if your yard has is is part of the rail system, they can't touch it. Huh, I, I, did I think not more often that. than than not, the the issue of going after larger companies when there is you know a, a chemical spill, you know any kind of major accident is those major companies are highly insulated by subcontracting out the work to where right, but that blame never is able to legally get kicked back up to them. But I think that's I think that's the point though. I think that that's what Justin say though is that if you write liability law in a way that says, "Okay, Norfolk, I mean, we're, we're sticking with picking on railroads right now. Okay, Norfolk Southern, you sub this out to this company, but they're doing com- they're doing business on your behalf, so you're still liable." You can write the law that way. They just choose not to. Mm-hmm. That's the point. Correct. No, I don't think they could write the law that way. I oh, they, can't, they absolutely they can't write. How many layers? What okay, is, okay. You you write the legislation. How many layers are you going to write into it? Because I guarantee you, the next day that company is going to add in one more. Then no, I, then then the, then the the law will take time, but it'll catch up. I mean, think about dram shop law, like the the, the way well, alcohol service goes in the well, state. No, go ahead. Think about it like this: if you've got a if you've got a company that is building a home for you, a company that's building a home for you. They subcontract a lot of that stuff out, but you're not going after the subcontractor because your contract's not with those people. Your contract is with the people, the home builder. Now, the home builder can go and seek uh, to get damages from the the company that they you know that screwed up, but the contract was signed with the home builder, not with the subcontractor and the con uh, the home builder is the one that's on the hook. Right. Uh, uh, or even a shorter example, you buy something off Amazon. It doesn't show up. You go to Amazon yeah. and say, Hey, the thing didn't show up. Amazon gives you your money back or sends you a new one. It, they, you don't go, you, you as the consumer don't have to go pick the fight with U- UPS or FedEx or whoever was the shipping agent. Or if it was a drop shipper, the company that was supposed to ship it on behalf of Amazon, and all that stuff, you just deal with Amazon directly. Because everything, even though they're summing out all these different tasks of what they do, it's still on Amazon's plate. It's the same premise. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand I mean, those it, examples. It is the same premise. I, I can give you even more examples of where this does not happen. Well, it doesn't. But I think the point that Justin and I are trying to make is it doesn't happen because the law isn't written in a way to protect people from that happening to them. It's written in a way to protect the company. I mean, these, these are these are just business. these are just liability laws, exactly. Right. Okay. Well, kick us with, hit us with one of your examples. I, 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 but, okay. No, I so mean, look, you, you know what LLC stands for, right? Limited Liability Corporation. Yes. Okay. So you realize that um, under federal law um, or fe- federal statute, uh, EPA regulations, uh, you you can only sue. For so much when you are offended by one of these companies, they put caps on how much you can sue for. That's why I have two LLCs. So, I mean, but that's, but that's that's what what I do. I mean, like they can only, the law right now says that the, the person who has been offended is limited in the damages that they can recoup by law. All they have to do is from one individual uh, entity. Right. 
So all they have to do is change the law to say it is no longer limited. And it opens the door. That opens the floodgate. The fear is it runs a bunch of companies out of business and hurts the economy because these companies are big, because these companies were allowed to get too big, because we wanted economies of scale and stuff. And now there's a vested interest in protecting these companies because everybody's invested in them. That's the real question. Well, I mean, as we're talking about, That's the fear the, the, the fear for me is, is, is uh, having owning two LLCs myself. Um, you know, the whole point of the LLC for me is, you know, if something happens at my business, I don't lose my house. Right. That's the whole point. That's, right. that's really it's, all it's I want. It's limited to the business. Right. It's not your whole, all of your possessions. Right. So I kind of, I kind of like that part of the limited, the, the LLC thing personally. Um, but I mean, it's, it's certainly, a, it's certainly a system that is abused in the sense where like Sam was saying, is it like, you know, sure. These companies I, I, open 50 using... LLCs that are just inside their own umbrella. You know, I mean, a great, I, I'm not, Go ahead. I'm, I'm not, not even that. that they, it's, I mean, is a they have companies outside of them. I'm not. I'm not talking about right under their own layer, layers of their own. Right, but I think the Amazon or the house building example covers what we're talking about. Is that at the end of the day, if I like, uh, if I were to contract a shipment to go from A to B with Norfolk Southern, and they sub that out to somebody else, if there's a problem with my my shipment, it's on Norfolk Southern. It's not on the in between. You know, right. what they do it, you know, like, so like, I, and, I, I don't know what, like what you said, you had examples and we kept going on other, other stuff. You know, one, of the, one of the big ones I saw was, I think it was a guy that got killed in an oil derrick that was, I don't remember the, the main, you know, corporation, but, you know, I'm assuming they had, you know, a company below them that probably found workers for the, you know, eight or 10 oil derricks in that area, but then some of those were then subcontracted out to other people to actually hire the workers or the maintenance crew for it. But you had this different layer of companies, like I said, not all within one umbrella to where they're actually owned by the same entity, but it's all just kind of getting subcontracted out into different levels to do a certain job. Okay. I think I've always said, but, I but it's a grunt it. worker on the ground that ended up, you know, bursting into flames and dying in front of his employees. Right. Because well, at the end yeah, of the day, that goes to BP. It's not necessarily he wouldn't BP's be suing. He, he wouldn't be suing the recruiting company that helped him get the job. He would be suing the company that was running the Derrick. Right. Right. Now, and so, the question would be if they're running that Derrick as an independent company from a shell or a BP to see if we take off this limited that we're talking about to see would, would he theoretically, because I, I, I think I see where Sam's coming from here. It's like, so theoretically if a company is doing business for whatever they're manufacturing a thing and um it's a it's a thing for commercial so it's got further uses they're they're doing a i don't know rotors for brakes or something like that they they and and a person gets killed on the job and those rotors are specifically made and built for ford does that individual have rights to go after not just the rotor company but ford as well because those rotors are exclusively made for ford if we're following the chain all the way up the hill, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And and we know they would because of the Pinto example that's in every textbook. <laughs> right. And then maybe they, and, and as they should, and, and maybe as they should and the, and how the law, how much liability the, the customer of a company would have in, in the sense like that. Well, I think there could well, be some, like, I mean, if it's something well, about the specs that they put together that makes it dangerous to manufacture, I could see that being, applicable right and let me make two points real quick um one I'm, I'm not saying that limited liability companies are a bad thing or anything like that i'm just saying i'm using that as an example simply to say that limited liability is a thing that exists in the law right um so uh, that's point one i'm i'm, I'm not like llc is a good thing i don't think you should have to lose your house if you've put you know, some money and savings in a business and tried to get it off the ground and somebody found a reason to sue you. I don't think they should be able to take every single thing you own. Maybe they can kill the business, whatever. Um, the, the other thing that, um, I'd point out, um, is with the, these, the argument is that the law can be changed in a way where the, the liability laws favor individuals as opposed to um, um, 
the companies or the industries that are offending. Um, and the best example I can give you of that right now is the push by Democrats to change the law so that gun manufacturers can be held liable for something like a school shooting. All they're doing is trying to change the law. And if they change the law, it becomes law and it becomes a thing. Uh, and by the, right, whether it, you agree by in the principle exact or not. same mechanism, we right. can pass laws that benefit individuals and allow them to sue without uh, um, restrictions in a way that uh, can have an impact on how a company operates in a real way. What was the, what's the, yeah, uh, no, uh, cause right. It's not, it, it's not whether you agree with the pol- like the, the, the premise behind it. It's that the, the structure is what we're talking about. Yeah. That, that's all I'm, that's all I'm saying is yeah. you have a, it's a sliding scale and the law benefits somebody more than somebody else. And it should always benefit the individual more than anybody else. But in our country, that's not been the case for a very, very long time in a lot of different ways. Right. I, I, um, I, 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 yeah, I'm on board. I'd like to see the, but my, my, my gut reaction thinking about those, like it'll be lawsuits. Like we are, we are already a litigious people. We are. And I would turn the dial up. Cause I, I, what's it? It's, it's, it's British law or whatever has it where, you can bring a lawsuit forward, but if you lose, you got to pay the bills for the other. I would like to yeah. see that become an, be, yeah, be, I don't have any, be going on board. I don't have that. any problem with that. Yeah. Well, we have I'm that in the U.S. system. You, you essentially you, you write that into your lawsuit. You counter sue. I see. I, I don't know. For in lawyers' my, expenses. In my personal experience, I, 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 I have not seen that as a thing. Stormy Daniels just, just lost well, a lawsuit for that. She has to pay, I forget, it's like $100,000, $150,000 for Trump's lawyers. I'm so confused on that one. It's it's more yeah, common right. than you realize. It, a lot of people do it, and and rightfully so. Counter if you have right, a sure. yeah. you file an immediate countersuit or whatever. Well, no, you do it as part of that proceeding. That I think that if you lose that judgment, if someone is filing oh, yeah. a case against yeah. you, you as a you as the defense, you're like okay. You, and I think as part of that trial, I don't think it has to be a separate trial. You can say, hey, if you don't find in the plaintiff's favor, and I was getting sued, I also once you say that. They don't win. Right. I also want judgment of you've now got to pay for what right. I had to pay right, to right. defend myself. You're right. I, I was conflating because I was the the one that I was thinking about was um, in what I was a plaintiff and I wanted to add my lawyer's cost to my judgment, and they said like, we're not allowed to do that. Uh, yeah. Which yeah, sucks yeah, because I, I, I'm suing that. somebody owes me fifty grand and I'm suing them for the fifty grand they owe me. Right. Well, that's, I'm going to give a third of that away to the lawyer because that's the way lawyers work. That's where you got to decide. Do you want to pay a lot of money for right. a good lawyer and guarantee a win or pay a little bit for a decent lawyer and have more in your pocket? Well, the the rule of thumb among lawyers, though, is it's a third of settlement. Yeah. Which apparently we're getting on uh, – we may be getting on a lawsuit. Uh, we may be suing the uh, uh, Department of Labor. Cool. Apparently there's something going on with the PPP loans where if we may have grounds yeah. – I think since we took one, it may not count, but I think – there's uh, a, I don't know. There's something going on because it's tax season right now. People are trying to do some shit, but there's some. Well, I've gotten a couple of different law, law, law offices call me up and <clears throat> and try to sell me on moving forward with this thing. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I was talking to our accountant today, and she's like, No, yeah, it's a thing. Um, yeah, we have an attorney that we've been working with for other clients. We'll send them to you, and you can talk it out. Hmm. But it's something yeah. along. I, I, I what it, my what I'm guessing it is is that it's uh, you know. You didn't get the PPP loan, but you should have. And right. basically, they're going to sue the, the Department of Labor for back whatever. You you kept uh, X number of people. Because right. we did. We actually, we grew. Ex- we added control. employees through the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and like, I, I don't think we lost. I don't think anybody. We didn't. We didn't lay anybody off for sure. And I don't think. I don't think anybody that worked for us then doesn't work for us now. Right. I think the handful of people that we've had quit or get fired or whatever have been post pandemic. Well, I don't know. Is it officially over yet? I think it officially ends this summer. Is that what's going on? Yeah, I think it's the, waiting, two we're, weeks. We're waiting for Biden to give us the official uh, the, the official end date. I think uh, they're expecting a couple more weeks, and that curve will flat. Two weeks, and we're done with it. All right, that's right. Two weeks, and it's over. Um, <laughs> so, but anyway, back to con law. Um, yeah. 
uh, so uh, okay so yeah philosophically i'm 100 percent on board with where you're at on it because i think that's the I, I think that's where the the conversation has been is the philosophically the 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 idea of why it exists is logical to an extent right but the reality is is that it's probably not functioning well in practice well it, it's it's i mean it's, it's kind of interesting if you if you look it up by states and like where states rank in uh are their health care providing or uh, um or in providing health care to their um citizens um it's kind of it's it's really kind of a mixed bag more of the certificate of need states are in the lower half of um the healthcare rankings um but it's not like a huge number so i think i, I think it's either i think it's 24 states that have a certificate of need law i think is what it is and i think like 14 of those states are in the bottom 25 um, don't quote me on that, but that's pretty close to accurate. Um, so there are a handful of states that have certificate of need that are ranked in the top 10, uh, two or three, I think is what it is. Um, but uh, most of the, uh, most states, uh, in the uh, upper echelon, I think are states that are, uh, sans certificate of need. Um, and again, what we're doing in Tennessee is not working, uh, according to national rankings. Um, so let's let the market, uh, see if, uh, it knows better than the bureaucracy and let's open the state up, uh, to let's cut the red tape to these subscription based services, um, that cover most of your healthcare for 60 bucks a month and uh, let people buy a catastrophic insurance policy on the back end. Um, are you familiar with these? Uh, um, what are they called? I mean, my, um, dad, my dad's got a concierge doctor, but that's a weird, complicated subset of things. Um, um, it's uh, direct primary care is what I was looking for. Right. It's, uh, if you're um, a single 30s, 40s person, something like that, you pay like 60 bucks a month and – you know, if you're sick with anything, they'll take care of it. You break a bone or something like that. They can set it and get you a cast, um, uh, maybe do some minor surgery kind of stuff. Uh, and like I say, it's 60 bucks a month. They give you like 300 visits in a year. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great go every day. And most of your healthcare. And then you can go out and buy a catastrophic insurance plan, which costs you 20 or 30 bucks a month because it only handles rare instances where you got to be rushed to the hospital and stuff. So uh, I, I think that that's more the model that you want. Right. Cause uh, I got a weird one. Like uh, my primary care provider, they do a thing where um, they've tried to price it. So it is the same, whether you have insurance or not. Mm -hmm. And so it gets this like weird, like it gets this weird thing where it's, almost cheaper to not have insurance to go use them yeah because you don't have the premium on top of right and right it's just this weird balancing it's like I, I i appreciate like that's a cool thing that you guys are trying to do for uninsured people but it's kind of a weird spot to put me in because it's like i'm paying my premiums plus but then that guy with no insurance is paying what i'm just paying out of pocket right it's a weird yeah um look at there's a place in Maryville or Blunt County, at least, I think it's called Trinity. Um, that is a direct primary care unit. Uh, and you can look and see what they, uh, uh, you know, what it covers, what it offers. Uh, it's literally like 97, 98% of what you would need is for regular health care, all the way to uh, diet plans and stuff like that to keep you healthy. Um, and you know, you walk in, you, uh, you pay your monthly subscription, you pay a $10 copay, they hit you with a Z pack, you're out of there, you know? Um, and I, I, I feel like, you know, with car insurance, your car insurance doesn't cover oil changes and gas and all that stuff. And that's why your car insurance isn't expensive as your healthcare insurance. Um, if you had healthcare insurance for 
catastrophic things, the, the unexpected things, which is what insurance is supposed to be for. Uh, and you had a subscription based thing that, um, handled the majority of everything else. Um, I think you're in a much better world. And I think that, you know, if the state has to be involved in healthcare and is going to pay the way for people to have health care, it would be a much lower cost for the state to right. pay these subscription-based right. things and buy a Well, because then the incentive for the health care provider is to keep you healthy because the healthier you are, the less they have to fucking deal with you. That's correct. And making you a less so, expensive, making it less expensive for them. Because, again, like that that's the thing to me is I think the further I've gotten into this politics game – whatever you want to call it is the more it's, it's trying to figure out the incentives. At the end of the day, incentives yep. are all that matters. What are we yep. incentivizing people to do? How are we incentivizing people to act? It goes back to, you know, yep. our liability conversation about the railroads and whatever. It's like <clears throat> there, we're incentivizing them to not give a shit about their, you know, um, environmental disaster cleanup or the, whatever. The repercussions of their actions. Right. We're, we're incentivizing them to just plow forward and do what they're, do what they're doing and not worry about these other parts of things where a reasonable person would, <clears throat> but when you put the incentive in place for them to not, that's what they're going to do. Um, and so on the healthcare one too, it's like, how do we incentivize doctors to actually care about people and taking care of people instead of taking care of their own bottom line right? or making sure that they're getting all their, you know, all their boxes checked the way we're currently doing so. And I think right. that's a, I, right. I, I, and whereas most models in the healthcare industry, all their money comes from insurance when people show up and need something from them right. with these subscription based things, people are paying a monthly subscription and that's keep, keeping these places in business regardless of what happens. So their incentive is exactly as you said, try to make sure these people are as healthy as they possibly can be. So they don't have to come in the door because that lowers their overhead. Right. And lowers My goal their is to cost. never see you again and, and not because money. you're dead. It's the opposite of what you find in the basic insurance um, uh, based healthcare system uh, nationally, statewide, whatever. Um, you know, that I, it's been my contention for years that insurance is just simply the wrong delivery system for healthcare. Um, because again, insurance is based on risk and it's supposed to be there to catch those unexpected things and ensure you against things that you can't take care of by yourself. Right. Uh, so getting sick is not unexpected. It's just specifically, right. specifically when you get sick is, but Correct. getting sick is Correct. not, yeah, everybody's going to get sick from time to time. Correct. So, um, you know, again, if you can pay 60 bucks a month and every time you get sick, you just make a phone call, show up, pay 10 bucks, get a Z pack, go home and you're fine. Um, and, and you know, you have an insurance policy for the catastrophic stuff, then I, I just feel like everybody's living in a much better world at that point. Everybody's saving money. The, the government at every level is saving money uh, because they're not, you know, paying hospitals to have people come in over and over and over again. Right. <laughs> because well, and again, uh, I think, I think more important, I think, I think the bigger one there is that it's, is that it puts it puts doctor's offices back into a customer service standpoint. Mm -hmm. Like their their goal is to be better to you as the patient as opposed to, I mean, like, again, that's another one of my isms is like you have incentives and you have a, you know, who's the actual, who's the, who is the customer and who, like, who is the product and what is the product and who is the customer? Right. You know, and, and in the healthcare one, it's very, the customer is the insurance company. I'm product. not sure what the product is anymore, but the, the customer is not the patient. Right. You know, the and, and in the, in the model of like the best way to get things and, and, and this may, it's, it's, it's a personal outlook, I suppose, but in the best way to get things done, you take care of the customer, the person that pays the bills. Right. 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 And no, I, I agree. The, in, yeah, in the, uh, healthcare is, Again, it's it's one of those things that the organization is. We'll talk about some certificate of need because we think the market is probably better than uh, the state managing healthcare. Uh, but we're not. 
We're not trying to. We, we, we would absolutely advocate to reduce the red tape for these uh, direct primary care outfits so that they can grow and expand in our state. But that's probably as much as we would do in healthcare. Right. You know, we're not. We're not going to go in and talk about bot grants and expanding Medicaid and all that stuff. It's that's a that's a behemoth that we are ill equipped to attack. All right. Well, on on a outside of your professional part, though. Um, I don't understand this Medicare expa- Medicaid expansion thing because all the Democrats that ran in Knox County, they all ran on, on that. I don't, I just don't understand it. Um, well, I mean, the, what I understand of it is there's a lot of money sitting in the rainy day fund that came to us from the feds that was supposed to be used for, statewide welfare programs that the state has chose to drop into the rainy day fund instead of using in the ways that the feds wanted us to use it, including expanding Medicare and Medicaid. My, my understanding is they they're running on it saying that we need to take that money out of the rainy day fund and use it for its intended purpose. Gotcha. Okay. Um, all right. Here's here. All right. Here's, here's one to add to your questionnaire for next year. Um, yeah. I would like to see a structure uh, a structure to said rating day fund, like a, a a a fixed number, a percentage of of our uh, our percentage of our annual budget, or something like that, where it says, okay, our budget our our budget for fiscal year twenty four is going to be X. The rainy day fund can max out at twenty five percent of X. Anything past that has to be spent or returned. That could be interesting. The thing is, is they'll just find ways to spend the money. I, that's that's so, it's better than sitting on it. Like that's that, so, that's my problem with it. Is like you know, like I get the premise. I think a rainy day fund's a good idea. I think we should have some savings in place. You know, for whatever things that we need to do, some crazy new, uh, super expensive, you know, infrastructure project that you know is 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 above and beyond, and we need to dip into that to grab it or whatever. But this mm-hmm. idea that the rainy day fund's good for existing and I'm going to run on, Hey, we've built the rainy day fund up X percent year over year for the last whatever year. Mm-hmm. At some point you're taking more money from me, the taxpayer than you're using to do the job that I asked you to do as the taxpayer. So either <laughs> stop taking it or give it back well, or use it. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I mean, I don't disagree with you in premise, but uh, like, Kind of the lay of the land as it actually is. Um, let's see. We had eight years of Haslam, and we're on, what, year five of Lee? Is that right? Something like that, yeah. So 13 years with uh, Republican governors in a row and uh, supermajority Republican the whole time, right? Pretty much, yep. All right. A, in 13 years... Uh, the state budget has more than doubled. Um, the last state budget was $52 billion. Um, uh, the last time we had a Democrat governor, his last budget was about 20. That's time that's, value that's, of that's money, my man. We also haven't raised taxes. Um, okay. So on that 52 million, what was our income? For twenty three, for twenty two, rather. What was our state income yeah. for twenty two? Well, I guess what, I mean better. Or, we need to go back to like twenty. Probably in the twenty million or twenty billion neighborhood. And the total budget was what? Fifty two. Billion with a B. Yes. So we spent you know two why? and a half times what we came we brought in. Yeah, you know why? I don't know why. That's how much money we get from the feds. Oh, I, I, Tennessee, I, did, I did know that part. As soon as I asked the question, I knew the answer. Tennessee gets uh, what second or third most amount uh, for, of any state in the entire country, and all the, uh, over thirteen years, that money has just continued to pour into this state from the feds. And the Republicans haven't raised taxes, but they've sure found a way to spend every single dime that's come in, every single dime. So, I mean. You can have them do whatever they want to do, whatever you want them to do with the brain day fund and stuff like that. But 
they're going to manipulate it to use whatever they want to use, make the numbers be whatever they want to be. Um, like, I mean, you can, there's accounting tricks, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you can play all kinds of games with that stuff. And that's all you're going to get. If you pass a bill like that, you're not going to, they're supposed to be fiscally responsible <laughs> now. Uh, and you can't pass a piece of legislation like trying to ban drugs. It's not like people are going to stop doing drugs because you say, hey, there's a law against drugs now. Same thing with the legislature. If you just tell the legislature, hey, there's a law that says you can't spend or waste our money, they're going to be like, oh, we're not. We're just using it in all these other different ways. All right, fine. Wait, you're just shattering my dreams. That was, <laughs> I mean, my, that was going to be my I, I whole like campaign. It. My whole campaign for District 18 was going to be <laughs> – it was going to be. I'm going to set the. I'm going to set that rainy day fund, and if we don't spend that money, you're getting. You're going to get a tax return from the state of Tennessee. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish you would, but they could have been giving us dividends on our tax dollars for the last decade instead of more than doubling our spending as a state. But they chose not to. <laughs> so, so are are we getting anything out of that doubling your spending? I mean, I don't think we might uh, get a weird services. footbridge over the from campus I, I don't think that services uh provided by the state um are twice as good as they were 20 years ago i don't think that's the case okay yeah because i mean like the children's services would be an easy one to start with yeah <laughs> right i mean it, it, we've got we got plenty of issues and plenty of problems and it's uh you know, we keep finding ways to spend new. I guess money. that. I guess that, that. That's the simple example to me. Like that's the simplest example. To me. It's like you're going to brag about a rainy day fund while we have kids sleeping under desks. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> right? I mean, <laughs> there's a there's a <clears throat> lot of different things we, out there. And, and I mean, trying to tell I'm me not, we've got the money. Like, uh, what, was it Sexton who was talking about? What was it? The education? It was an education one. I know that's not in your wheelhouse, but refusing federal education dollars. Because Knox County, in particular, just lost a lawsuit for some uh, because of because Knox County Schools takes federal education dollars, they're obligated to do something in the handicap, you know, the special needs department. Like there's some rules mm-hmm. and stuff or whatever. They lost a lawsuit because they didn't do whatever with this particular kid, and the right. only reason they lost that lawsuit is because it went federal because the state of Tennessee didn't give a shit about this kid, but the federal government and however that worked with federal funding getting into Knox County schools that they therefore have to fe- follow the federal rules on how to use that money. Yeah. It's really kind of, it is dumbfounding when you, you're looking at these things from a 10,000 foot view, because you remember a couple of years ago, we passed the, the texting while driving bill. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that bill was, uh, um, something else about DUI and I can't remember what it was, but we passed that bill specifically because it opened us up to get more federal dollars. We wanted that federal money, right? but with the education thing that you're talking about, they're all, Oh, we don't want that federal money because it ties us to do certain things. So, I mean, it, it it's, it's an issue when they want it to be. It's not an issue when they don't want it to be. Right. And it's all about a narrative that they're trying to put out there that will help them stay in power. Right. That's, that's, that's all we see. Which, like, I mean, the, yeah. Cause that goes back to one what, of my things. That's what a, your job is as an elected official is narrative creation. Right. Right. Cause yeah. Cause going back to earlier, what we were talking about is like how many bills that Gloria introduced that got killed and then were immediately right. introduced by somebody else because the narrative is that we did this, not them. And it's a narrative that they created right. intentionally. Oh, it's frustrating. Ain't it? I mean, it's, I mean <laughs> at some point, at some point I don't even know what that groan means anymore. Like I just do it. Like I just make I the mean, noise. It, 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 so much of it really is a dog and pony show. <laughs> so much of it. Um, not all of it, but Seth thinks they do nothing up there anyway. I mean, <laughs> not nothing good apparently. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, I, so I'll, I'll pitch this. I'll pitch my one of my 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 super solution to the world at large uh, to you is that we need to flip over the way we look at government in, in in the United States. That you and Nashville, you need to care more about who the mayor of Nashville is than who the president of the United States is, and oh, that yeah. your and and your money should reflect that. And I think that yeah. it goes back to so much of what we've already talked about tonight is that. 
we're 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 so good at, at at rolling it all uphill and caring about the tip toppy whatever that has the least real functional whatever to our day to day, and that you know, and again, it's, it's like you were talking founding father stuff earlier too. Is like I think that at least at a state level, that's how the design was originally intended. Sure, and but, I would like to but, go. I would like to break it down a little bit further. I would like it to go to county level. I would like the county to go first, and then the state, and then the federal government, instead of it being at least functionally, perceptively by the masses, federal first, and work your way down. Yeah, it, it, you're a hundred percent right. But the reality is, is, it's kind of the way that it actually works. I mean, let's take for example the um, two district attorneys. Um, elected district attorneys in Nashville and Memphis that said that they weren't going to prosecute marijuana crimes. So what did the state legislature do? The state legislature went and tried to pass a bill. I don't know if they passed it or not because I wasn't tracking it, but they went and tried to pass a bill that would allow the state to remove those district attorneys for not upholding the laws created by the state. I mean, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You know what I mean? Right. Um, we, well, I mean, we it's like, I mean, it's so much stuff in Nashville right now that they're, that the state's trying to push down on Nashville because they're mad at them for not taking a fucking convention. Yeah. It, it, I mean, you got the bill that says how many people that the cities can have in their city council or right. county commission. Well, we have, is. right. And we have here in Knoxville, yeah. they're trying to go, the state's trying to pass a bill that's going to change the way the city of Knoxville elections work. And I actually right. agree in principle with, <laughs> with what the state is trying to do here, but I, also say city of Knoxville should figure this out for themselves. It's none of your business state. Let us do our city the way we want to do it. The only reason that Knoxville even gets to have the conversation is because they're a home rule County and not a charter County. Everybody else, most counties in the state are charter counties, which makes them subdivisions of the state, which means the state is in fact the law of the land first and not the County. Well, correction on that. I apologize for correction. The city of Knoxville is home rule. Knox County is not. Oh, is that right? I believe that's the case because that's the argument that's going on right now with this with uh, with this bill. I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but uh, um, sure. I mean, either way, well, the principle. point that I'm trying to make the the only point that I'm trying to make is I agree with you. It should be a bottom up the 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 lower the government that you are closest to. The smallest government should have the most effect over your life, and it should trickle up. But that's just not the way the laws work. That's not the way that they've created this, uh, they, that they built this. Right, and then it's going back built to in a way that the state runs it. Right, and what what incentive does anybody in the process have to to fix that, to correct that thing? You know, that yeah, would, and they've that, actually got the opposite incentive because it, they would be reducing the amount of power that they're group their team has and uh, open doors for other people to take power from them. Yeah. And that's so a, they, they, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to go anywhere. I think there's the last like five minutes of what we've done is the totality of my, my outlook of life right now that drives me well, crazy. Uh, and, and, and this is why I think that an organization like mine could actually be a game changer. Think about it. There are, 6.6 million people in the state of Tennessee. There are 3.1 million people that are registered voters or that voted in the last election. I'm not sure which one of those is the case. I would say registered because I don't think that's a, I don't think that many actually voted. But go ahead. Sure. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> but let's say that we get a million people in the state of Tennessee to check 15 boxes on 15 pieces of policy. You know, if we can get if we can explain the way the state has control over every county in the state in a way that makes sense to people and ask them if they think the state should have that control and we get a resounding answer from a million people, 98% say, no, they shouldn't have that. My God, we can walk into every single legislator's office and be like, hey, we got 70% of your district, the, the the super voters in your district that want this to change. Are you going to help us with this or do we just tell them that you didn't want to help? I mean, they don't have a choice. Yeah. We, we, we create a bully pulpit and that's that's the only way we can self-govern. That, that's the way that we do this. We get everybody together. We say – Here's the survey. Everybody did it. You can call any of these people and see if it was a real thing. And they live where they live. You can do any of that stuff. But the bottom line is 
we have all your voters and all your voters want you to be on our side with this. Are you going to be on our side or are we going to tell your voters that you're not on our side? Right. And, but uh, yeah, it's that engagement, like that, that, that engagement thing. It's just, it's. Right. I, I, and you know, with us, like I say, we take a different approach. We don't go out and attack people. We're not trying to create enemies. Uh, we're trying to be friends with everybody because all we want is to get our bills passed. We don't oppose anything. We, there's, 1,500 bills that are introduced every single session. You can bet 1,430 of them at least are bad. What's the point in picking out five or six and saying, these are awful? All you're doing is telling people that wrote those bills that you think they're dumb because they wrote those bills. And those people can help you. So we don't, we're not going after anybody. We're not going and attacking anybody. We're not going out and trying to kill bills. All we're doing is saying, hey, Here's some liberty issues. Everybody likes these issues. You should like these issues too. If you help us, we say thank you. you damn it, I'm sold. Us. I don't have the money for you, but I'm going to have to get my damn membership now. Son of a bitch. But I mean, it, it really is. It really should be this simple. It really should be this well, simple. Well, I mean, That's it's, all. it's, it, and I think it, I think it is that simple. It's just that we're busy doing other shit. Yeah. You know, I'm, we're, yeah. We're, we're busy, you know, watching UT football. Good shirt choice, yeah. by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wore this. I wore this to the Alabama game and down on the field where I smoked a cigar. Oh, say. Oh, uh, I don't know if Satchi's. I don't know if Satchi's passed for that. You don't know if you need to admit that crime. I'll tell you what. Here's <laughs> here's here's a, a very super uber local thing that drives me crazy. Um, the uh, city of Knoxville has decided not to revoke the Armark, the the vendor who does beer services at UT for their uh, multiple underage service violations, and I'm pissed about They've it. They've decided not to? Correct. Good. You're wrong. <laughs> makes me Why really should they mad. revoke it? Well, because, I mean, it's, it, 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 to me, it's, it, it is a clear example of, well, here are the rules we put in place, but it doesn't count for you guys because you guys are, you know, more important than everybody else. Did you go to the University of Tennessee? I did. You s- did you go straight out of high school? I did. Do you have a place you could drink before you turn twenty one? Uh, no. Well, I mean, I had a buddy down the hall in my dorm that had that that did. I did not have a. Were I you? did not have a local. I did not have a, a, a. I did not drink in public underage. Really? No, I Shoot, went. I, I was. I was, I was drunk in public places that served drinks plenty of times, but I never drank in. <laughs> I never drank in public underage. Mm. I can't say that that's uh, that I had the same experience when well, I was at UT. Of sure. all the places on the list that you that you know, and again, <laughs> but that's but I, that, actually that's a good example. of The point: those places that you're referencing that still do exist to some extent. Maybe the strip is dead anyway, but um, those places that did exist when they got caught because of people like you, they got shut down for a period of time <laughs> and lost a ton of fucking money. Sure. sure, but the University of Tennessee gets a gets a pass. I, I, I Not mean, to mention that there was a riot following one of their alcohol-infused uh, debacles of a game day. I might have been there. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you just admitted <laughs> that you were there, but yeah, but it really wasn't a riot. It was. I mean, I walked down to the field and I stood there and I took a bunch of pictures and stuff, and then I walked off the field. That's I mean, I've, I've been happened. on that field at least a uh, fifty times too, but I was supposed to be there. Yeah. yeah. But it was um, fun to be there and not. It's just, I mean, again, it's 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 a, it's an equal application of law argument for me. It's a, I've got friends that own bars and restaurants that have been significantly hampered by dumbass mistakes from staff, which is essentially what happened to UT as well, where their sure. their entirety of their existence depended on the ability to sell alcohol, where it is not that big a deal for UT. On the end of the day, okay. it's good money. I mean, don't don't can, get me wrong. They 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 were you, doing like seven hundred thousand dollars a game day. So you're not suggesting that they shouldn't sell beer on at, uh, the games. You're suggesting that Aramark should be pulled because of their violations. I mean, that, that, that'd that be a minimum. I, I, I would be, uh, okay, a different vendor can come in and do it, but at least at least Aramark should lose their rights to do it for the period of time than anybody else would. I, I can get on board with Aramark should lose their um, uh, license as long as we're still talking about replacing them. Yeah, I mean it's a weird it's a weird ism because there's very few circumstances. I mean there are. I mean you do like a wedding venue or something like that where you bring in a third party uh, uh, bar staff or whatever. 
I'm mm-hmm. not sure how the law sits on whether the venue would lose their ability to have alcohol service from third party vendors or whether they would that third party vendor should be the one to lose their their ability to serve. Well, the University of Tennessee is a state run institution, so it would take the state to pull Tennessee's the ability to sell booze. Right. But that's a, the, the that's not a beer permit in the sense of a regular service permit. That's just their ability to have beer sales on their property. Correct. Correct. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I get what you're saying. <laughs> Six but or half I dozen absolutely... on that part, but. Right. Well, I absolutely think that you should have alcohol at those sporting events. Uh, people are idiots everywhere with or without alcohol. If you tell them they can't have it, they sneak it in uh, and they still get drunk. Um, I remember, I remember I was probably in my twenties and I was at Thompson bowling watching a, a Louisville versus UT basketball game. Um, and, uh, it was way before we, they sold alcohol on campus. Um, and <laughs> the guy in front of me was so freaking drunk and he had been drunk the whole game. And at one point it was like this big moment, everybody stood up and jumped and all this stuff. And this drunk, <laughs> this drunk guy stands up and loses his balance and falls face first at, at Thompson bowling over the, the row of seats in front of him and just sticks with his face on the ground and his legs up in the air. <laughs> and, I, you know, no harm, no foul. I, I, I thought it was hilarious. It's <laughs> one of the highlights of my life. And I mean, I'm it's... really glad that he was drunk when he wasn't supposed to be at that sporting event because it made my experience better. <laughs> Fair enough. I just, I get it. It's, it's an equal application of law issue to me. Um, I agree. I can get you there. I, I, you know, I, like the, I agree there. It's just soft ass arguments. Like it just kind of like, well, University of Tennessee, uh, uh, Nayland Stadium is bigger than, you know, what the majority of cities in the state of Tennessee yeah. on a game yeah. day. So the yeah. rules are should be a little bit different for them. It's like, nah, I don't know. It yeah. shouldn't be different. For I them. mean, it's a big money generator, man. Right. But they it also they also they also know what they're doing and they've done they've done game days for a long time. They know what they're doing. They know how to handle a crowd of 120, 110,000 plus mm-hmm. people. So to, to give them a pass because they're a huge place and, you know, seven weekends a year, I, yeah. I just, I don't know. It pissed me off. I, 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 I mean, I, I hear you, but, um, I, I absolutely am a fan of, uh, alcoholic beverage with my sports viewing. I, I don't disagree with that. I, I'm a fan of my alcoholic beverages of sitting around talking to people about politics and shit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, sitting here uh, pounding beers. All right. Is there anything else we need to cover? Anything specific? Give your, give me the whole spiel. Give me all the deets so that people can, can pay you money to go do these things. Uh, for all org is the website and it is really easy to donate and become a member there. Uh, becoming a member lets you get our member surveys, which uh, essentially dictate our path. Uh, One of the things that uh, our organization kind of does to separate itself is we don't set our own agenda. Uh, What we do is we say, hey, here are 30 different ideas uh, based on the realities of the law here in Tennessee. And those things could be eminent domain they could be cryptocurrency it could be uh making sure all of the votes are on the record instead of having voice votes oh yeah that's another one yeah Uh, there's a lot uh, it's everything and uh you know we ask our members which ones they think are most important which ones they think we should go and pursue and uh, uh that's how we get our short list of bills that we're going to work on in a given session because yeah, that, uh, so, that that good 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 call and reminded me of that one because that was one that I that, that, that was one that that um, I'm I'm 100 percent on board with. I think it's yeah, if, I, you're, I, if you're if you're if you're an elected official, your vote should be registered every single time, every single one, every single time you cast one. Yeah, I think that's um, the idea that a voice vote counts. I mean, it's just oh, it's awful. Uh, we got burned on one of those a couple. Yeah, of the years. last time we did the show, we talked about that one. Yeah, yeah, um, we uh, we want to vote four to three. Uh, and uh, the chairman called it for the no- nose on a voice vote. And then we went back to the chairman with written statements. It was too, you took too long. Five, from, 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 four, or from the four guys that voted with us that 
gave us the majority, and uh, we were told to kick rocks. Yeah, that's it. I like it's. I don't know. Is it like so? Watching some of these sessions and the the one you were talking about is that they had the, um, after they did the voice vote on that one, if anybody would like to register and know, see the clerk. Is that yeah, a new they thing? Yeah, that, that all the voice vote. Is that new or has that been that way? I think it's been that way, and it's just one of those things where if they want to go and record their vote one way or the other, they can. Um, but if they don't, then they don't. It gives the opportunity for the legislators to say, this is how we cast our vote. Um, but most of them don't do it because they might upset a chairman. Right. And that might make it hard for their bills to get through a particular committee. Fucking children bullshit. It's really the way it goes. All right. So standard <coughs> format. Here we go. Oh, funky. Sam's News is the Weird, everybody. That's how we're going to shut the show down like we always do. This Florida man tried to give the cops the slip, literally. A naked burglar covered in wheel bearing grease, peppermint oil, and his own blood was caught jumping into a stranger's pool and on the trampoline in the middle of the night. I don't see a victim here. What's going on? What was the crime? <laughs> he was, they he, just I having fun. This story. I, mean, I, I, I mean, I disagree. I, I, there's absolutely a crime in, in trespassing and using other people's stuff. Especially when you, you got a picture. I heard that story uh, earlier so. today in the yeah. car. Actually, yeah, we love our news of the weird. We like to close off on. You got a fun news of the weird that you've heard? <laughs> no, I don't have anything other than there. the drunk guy falling on at the Thompson Bowling. Yeah, you, you already got oh, that one. Great, <laughs> classic. All right, Sam, is that it? You got, you got anything else? You got one more you want to stick in? That's nothing super crazy. <laughs> All right. Well, the funky the funky time has passed. Thanks for listening, everybody. That's a show. Oh, a special thanks to Justin for coming out or well, coming out through the uh, Zoom internet thing, doing that thing, <clears throat> enlightening important things that are happening that we don't really pay attention to, and um, or the things that we do pay attention to and don't understand how they work and all that kind of stuff. So, but we're almost in agreement. Almost in agreement at gmail.com. Find us on Twitter, on YouTube, on Facebook. Uh, go to your favorite podcast provider. You can hook us up uh, with a like and a share and uh, telling your friends about us kind of thing. Um, we're going to keep working on stuff. We've got uh, city elections for 23. Uh, yeah, getting a little bit more serious. I'll start working on getting a few of the candidates. I mean, hell, I've already got a District 4 candidate for 24 talking to me about doing a show for the 24 race. Um, uh, yeah, so um, I'm still going to try to get Zachary to come on the show. I doubt that's ever going to happen, but I'm going to keep working on that. I want to do some session review stuff with whoever I can get to talk to me about uh, what's happened, what they've done. Um, I'm going to wait a little bit though. I'm trying to reach out to Gloria. I'm sure she's busy with way bigger than me right now. So um, we're almost in agreement. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll do this again very soon.